Thanks, Rolf. Uh, evening, ladies and gents. So last year, I that didn't work. Last year, I, this presentation, exactly 52 weeks ago, I ended with that picture. Um, and we all laughed. I noticed none of you are laughing right now. <laughs> that pretty much, so there was the fires in California in December of last year, and that pretty much sums up uh, what 2018 ended up being. Uh, and the, the, the worst part about 2018 is that I think most of us came into the year with a level of optimism. Certainly I did. Um, and uh, at best, we can say we got beaten black and blue this year. Um, my trading portfolio is green by about 12 cents, not percent, cents. Um, and my equity portfolio, I haven't yet done, but I, I, I don't hold great hope for it. Um, and if you thought that was it, so that's, you know, and then Poloni tried to kill us. I mean, Poloni, come on, really? Um, and so, I mean, that is my picture of 2018, and I got a word for you for 2019, but the word of 2018 for me was Poloni. When your Poloni is killing you, then, then I mean, like quarters, come on, like, like uh, anyway. So as every year, I go and I ask folks on Twitter in the week leading up to this presentation what the expectation is, and last year we were bullish, 77% said, and that was the highest bullish number I've ever seen, and this is our fifth uh, presentation here every, every year end, and that was by a long way the highest level of bullishness we had seen. And this was ahead of NASRIC. We still didn't know quite who was going to come out to the top at the ANC elective conference. And truthfully, it was close. Uh, Ramaphosa won by a couple of hundred votes out of out of thousands of them. Um, we almost got uh, a Zuma, whether it was Jacob or Kusazana Glamini. Um, but there was a high level of bullishness. That's what I mean. We were expecting a lot more from 2018. Um, and then this week, uh, still a 62% level of bullishness for, for, for looking ahead to 20, 2019. And that is surprisingly insightful because the easy point is, is recency bias, right? You've just been beaten black and blue by, by not just the market, by everything, politicians, stock markets, Poloni, everything has beaten you for the year. And, and the response is to then go deeply negative on, on, on the immediate future, which is then 2019. But if you ponder it and think about it, there, there's, some, there's some levels of, of, of perhaps some, some optimism for next year, but we'll delve into that into a moment. The first point is, in interests of fairness, I then go and I haul out my presentation from last year and see what I said and have a look-see at what I got right and what I got wrong. Uh, so let's get that over and done with very quickly. Uh, my first prediction was I thought the top 40 would be green for this year. We are red, we're 9% down, that is as of uh, yesterday's close, 52 weeks to yesterday's close, including dividends, we are red for the year, minus 9%, which in and of itself is not, I mean, 9% down, meh. The problem is the first the three and a half years before that, we were 0%. Um, so like we were punch drunk already, and then we have a, a down year. I expected the rand to be stronger. We are stronger. Uh, when I left home this afternoon, we were stronger by exactly 1.8 cents. Not percent, 1.8 cents. Um, so we were flat, truthfully. Uh, I said we would get a VAT increase. We got that. I said Bitcoin, there will be tears. Yeah, we got that. Uh, I said there wouldn't be a recession. Yeah, I got that wrong. The, the recession the recession caught me very much by surprise. I wasn't looking for massive economic growth in South Africa. You know, maybe you know, at a top level, 1.5%, uh, truthfully, probably closer to 1%. The fact that we ebbed into recession was, was quite a surprise. And I remember in the budget speech, and I can't remember who I've, who was our finance minister in February. It was Melissa Gagaba. It was Melissa Gagaba. Yes. Um, who's no longer even an MP. In the budget speech of February, Melissa Kagabo does his projections for GDP growth for the next couple of years going forward. And his projection for 2018 was something 1.2, and he's wrong. His projection for 2019 was 1 uh, 1.7, and he's probably wrong on that. And his projection for 2020 was 2%. And I remember that week saying, if we're only doing 2% growth in 2020, somebody help us. And right now we need, I mean, please, let's have 2%. I mean, it's looking grim out there. Um, I said local rates would be flat to down in terms of interest rates, and our good governor gave us a rate increase. I'll talk more about that in a bit, so I was wrong about that. I said Steinhoff was going to get uglier, and it has. Uh, it's only got another one rand 78 of ugliness to go, um, and then it is bankrupt, and technically Steinhoff is bankrupt. Uh, I said US rates would go up in EU unchanged. Those were easy uh, predictions. I'll come back to them in more detail. So the S&P would be green for the year. It is green for the year by one point. 
literally one point. But hey, you know, green is green. Uh, I said oil would be flat. Oil is flat, but that doesn't tell the story, which was oil went to $82, I'm talking Brent, and then came back to where it started the year. So yes, flat, but if you have any, I mean, if you here today, unless you walked, uh, you have had the impact of oil. And of course, now we're all rolling in it. We're feeling like, you know, jawless because the petrol price came down a buck 84 yesterday, but it is still way above where it was uh, a year or three or five ago. Uh, I said platinum still goes nowhere, and I said Trump remains a fool. Those two were quite easy. You've always, the trick with making predictions, I went to the horse races on Saturday, which is a very sad place to go, but anyway. I went to the horse races on Saturday, and you've always got to have those bankers, right? Those certainties. And those were my two bankers. I mean, they were just like easy. Um, so the truth is, there's a lot of green in that screen, but actually the two that count I got wrong. I mean, those are the two that count. The recession in the top 40 is, is where the sort of metal hits the road. We didn't collapse. The recession was fairly short uh, and fairly modest and already been revised upwards because I mean, the, the GDP data of last week, the second quarter went from minus 8 to minus 0.8 to minus 0.4. So apparently it wasn't as bad as we anticipated. Um, so yeah, lots of green, but wrong on the, the two that really, really matter. So we put that out there. So that preference is everything else I'm going to say this evening, which is not unfair. Those were the stocks I particularly looked at last year. Top 40 down 9%, shop right 10 and a bit. These are including dividends, long for life 7. Uh, Mr. Price did very well. Signia and, and Sasfin, which I had great hopes for, were the two absolute outliers getting slaughtered. Uh, the Finney index, yeah, 1.6. I mean, it's green. Uh, Mid-cap, so-so, and bulletin. So really only two stocks that actually did very much. If you're looking for, you know, relative, okay, so you know, those are kind of like within the space. And the distinction is relative versus absolute performance. Absolute performance is, you know, you've got to beat zero or you've got to beat inflation, um, which is you know, very much more a very sort of conservative, very sort of cautious uh, uh, strategy. And when the boom years, you give up a lot of return, but you don't get the, the, the red years and the bad years. In theory, practice a different kettle of fish as well. But in essence, if our market's down 9% and your portfolio is down 6 that's winning. I know it doesn't feel like it's winning, but that really is in the mind of the, 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 the marketing peeps at, in financial institutions, that is winning. But those two, and, and, and I've got some slides coming later in the presentation, so I'll delve into it more at that point. The problem with this market is if you are in ETFs, if your portfolio is exclusively ETFs, you've probably done, you know, you're down. You're, you're in the red for the year, but, you know, you're not, even if you went to the US, you know, S&P flat, ran flat, you're flat in there, you, you're, you're probably single digit into the red if you've got an ETF, a broad-based ETF portfolio. You know, top 40s, S&Ps, MSCR Worlds, and stuff like that. But if you started going niche and started becoming a stock picker and started saying, I want to have a niche ETF, not a broad ETF, or, you know, like you wanted to have the indie uh, instead of the top 40, or if you were buying individual shares, this year there was a real chance that you held one of those stocks that got decimated. And those two, I mean, 36% down is not decimated. 36% down, you don't even get to call the emergency room. I mean, that's like, you know, that's like a slight bruising compared to some of the numbers out there, and I'll get to those in a moment. So some burning questions before we look towards next year, and the first is trade wars. Um, and in particular, you know, the NAFTA trade war, yeah, really Canada, Mexico, we love them, but they're not, you know, the EU and, and the US, yes, yes. But the big issue is China and America, the two largest economies in the world, collectively 45% of global GDP, uh, one and a half billion people, so a little under, what, 20% of the world's population. Um, and we have, you know, the simmerings of a trade war. And over the last weekend, there was the G20 meeting, and Trump met Xi, met Xi uh, and they had a, a, a sideline bilateral dinner, and Trump was tweeting about how great everything was, and Monday was just a boom day. We were up 3%, you know, trade peace in our time, everything would be lovely, and then it turned out that what Trump was saying was at best hocus pocus. Um, he said there's a 90-day extension, but no one knew when it started or when it ended. He said that China promises to buy more American stuff, but when pressed as to what stuff and how much, 
he's like, you know, American stuff. And like, uh, no, we don't know. And then China then started tweeting last night and saying, or the night before, and saying, no, actually, there is some deal happening here, maybe. And Trump's response is, yeah, you see, China, it's a long way to get home to China. Oh, I mean, so why is trade wars bad? So tra I mean, yeah, we, 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 we are sitting in the JSC, which is the heart of capitalism in our in our country. Yeah, you know, and at the heart of capitalism, what capitalism is about is the free flow, the free flow of ideas, the free flow of people. Yeah, I know, yeah, yeah, but that's what capitalism is about. And importantly, the free flow of capital and commodities slash assets. That's what drives capitalism. And yes, it does mean that maybe your product is made in China because they can make it better faster and cheaper than you can in America, and capitalism says that is what we want. We don't care about the unemployed Americans. We want our iPhone to only cost 26,000 czar. If they made the iPhone in America, it would be 56,000 czar. So thank goodness for the Chinese. Trump, of course, well, Trump, of course, doesn't agree with that, apparently. He also thinks that he doesn't seem to understand uh, uh, who's the economist who writes for the New York Times, Krugman, and he's saying it's a Trump doesn't understand that a tariff is actually a tax on the American consumer because they pay more. Yes, it hurts China because China is able to perhaps sell less because of those tariffs coming in. If they put a 25% tariff on an iPhone, they will sell less iPhones in America, which means China will generate less revenue as an economy. I get that. But this is hurting, and it is going to hurt the American consumer. The good news of the situation is that this is how Trump works, right? He's a bully. So he softens you up. He beats you over the head. He steals your lunch money, et cetera, et cetera. And then he comes and offers you a deal eventually. We saw it with NAFTA, and I can't believe that he is stupid enough to allow a full-blown trade war with China. If we get a full-blown trade war with China, everything I say this evening is irrelevant because we will get a global recession, global stock markets will go down, and we will have a global recession. The two largest economies in our world having a trade war is going to be devastating on the global economy. I think that at some point between, the, between now and the end of the first quarter, we will see some level of of agreement exactly what that will be who knows the shape and form it will take i have no idea but there will be some level of agreement and what that will give us is certainty where we sit right now is that lack of certainty we don't know what's happening until the next presidential tweet and frankly that tweet might be superseded by another presidential tweet five minutes later saying something else and you can't you can't do anything without certainty you know, would you, uh, and I'm going to talk about ESCOM in a moment, but do you build a factory in South Africa when your, your certainty of power is, well, um, there's no certainty of power? The answer is no. You build your factory somewhere else because we are a global economy, because we have capitalism. You build the factory where you get certainty, certainty of power, certainty of, of, of regulation, certainty of rules. These are the sort of things that we need to grow economies. And the potential threat of two of the largest economies in the world having a trade fight is is not go it gives us absolute no certainty so that is the single biggest risk i do think that ultimately cool heads have to prevail and if they don't somebody help us uh, the truth is that living down here in the southern tip of africa we will be directly less hurt from trade wars but indirectly we will suffer you know 60 percent of the earnings of the top 40 are beyond our borders and that 60 percent will hurt i mean you know we'll be sitting here with our candles and all will be fine but the rest of the world won't quite fallen angels um so this is the year of fallen angels man and you know what i, I stopped writing when i ran out of space because uh, because truthfully i could have carried on going and looped around the wall and come back there and still be printing stocks um and yeah, and I, I, I have the Hindenburg for a particular reason, because the Hindenburg disaster, as much as it looks spectacular, hydrogen rises, so fires aren't really a problem because we don't rise because of gravity, and burning hydrogen actually rises a whole lot faster, so most people survive the Hindenburg disaster, notwithstanding that visually it looks like an absolute nightmare. There were surprisingly few fatalities as a result. And of these falling angels, there will be few long-term fatalities. Most will survive. The exception on that list is Avenge, will not. Um, 
And NASPASS is not a typo. I'm now doing the official NASPASS, which is NASPASS N. In other words, low voting shares. Let's not pretend that we get a vote when you buy a NASPASS share. NASPASS don't vote on Tencent and you can't vote on NASPASS. You're just buying profits that may or may not flow. They will survive and they will recover. The two questions are when, and the answer is no, single, no, no idea whatsoever. And do they get back to their lofty days? Does Aspen get back to 440? Sure, absolutely yes. When? Well, don't hold your breath because you will turn blue. Um, what we saw were the darling stocks getting chronically overpriced and the market, and let's quickly touch and use Aspen as the example. Aspen was evolving into a mature, low growth company and the market took a very long time to work that out. And we really only worked it out with the last set of results. We had the spook in January when we thought Viceroy was going to go for Aspen. Uh, they didn't. They went for Capitech, uh, which I didn't see coming at all. I ran my eye down my portfolio and I thought, ah, they're going to go for Discovery. And they didn't. They went for Capitech. And I'm like, yeah, but we wrote about that in Financial Mail literally two years ago. Aspen at 140 bucks is actually on a PE of about 11 is an attractive share price. But your days of... 20, 30, 40% growth are gone. This is a company that might do you high single digit growth. It's become a mature business. And in hindsight, it's easy, right? They were buying generic drug manufacturers who grow at low single digit growth. Um, and of course, that would then evolve their company into a mature business. So these fallen angels will mostly recover. Ascenders, I'm not 100% sure about either, and that's got their own issues, not mostly with directors and, 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 and their, their trading situations. The companies will recover. But if you had any of those in your portfolio in January, well, he's not so much, but in January, you're under, you, you've had a horror, horror year. And that's not even the horror ones. Here are the horror ones. So I stole this from Twitter. And they stole it from Morningstar, uh, dated 22 November. So it's like way out of date because we've had a rough time since then. 43% of companies are more than 50% off their five-year their five -year high. Ponder that a moment. 43% of JSC companies are down more than 50% over the high of five years. And, and these are, I mean, some of them, you know, Avenge, Basil Reed, Lonman, Group 5, Steinhoff. Okay, fine. Brait, I mean, yo, come on, Brait. I mean, Blue Label was a market darling. Mediclinic, uh, Fortresses, yeah, Coronation. I mean, th these are not the obvious, well, yeah, they were always dodgy fly by night. These are some, I mean, British American tobacco. You know, I can remember probably just a year ago, you know, if you had a portfolio, you started with British American tobacco, assuming you didn't mind killing your customers. I mean, ethics aside. The point being is it was stable, it was dependable, um, and, and you know they could push prices up faster than smokers could die, and all was good. And the stock just got absolutely slaughtered and killed. And, and there's a very simple reason why British American tobacco is being slaughtered, notwithstanding their business model and the health of their consumers, is that the tobacco companies around the world thought that vaping was their solution, and they could sort of bypass the legislation and governments for all you want to say about politicians, they caught this one and they said, no, guys, 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 well, well, vaping is smoking. It's the same thing. It's just a different mechanism. I mean, I remember being in an airplane where the guy next to me was vaping. And I'm like, he vapes. I can't smoke. Like, what's the difference? Truth is, none. It's delivery mechanism. So suddenly their, 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 their clever strategy to get past the regulations with the vaping devices, and it's in the legislation which is currently before cabinet in South Africa, which says cigarette, vaping device, same thing. The laws apply exactly the same to both. And of course, British American Tobacco went and did a massive deal for which they overpaid, as did Woolies, as did uh, many of the stocks on that list there. So here's a top tip. This you really can bank on. You can write this down and quote me on it. When a share that you own goes and does a big offshore deal, sell it. The sooner you sell, the better. And yes, I own Woolies and famous brands, so I'm personally like affronted by this. But the short answer is big deals, and I remember reading research on this about 10 years ago, big deals don't work. M&A activity, large M&A activity, and this was a, a research report out of MIT in the US, so this is not local data. Big deals, big M&A activity fail on average 85% of the time. The other 15% of the time, they don't produce massive profits, they just don't fail. In other words, 
you know, they get the pass mark, whatever that pass mark is, what, 30% or whatever it is locally. I, they, they kind of, and, and you get it, right? So you're the expert in selling burgers to South Africans, and you've been selling burgers to South Africans for 30, 40 years, and you've got this market totally sussed. So you go and buy a gourmet burger chain in the UK. What do you know about selling burgers to the UK? And you think, oh, well, burgers in UK, it's all the same. It's not the same. It's never the same. It never is the same. And we see that all over the place. Mediclinic, that's why they're on that list. Uh, uh, British American Tobacco, Woolies, those are why they're on that list. And when I, so you have been absolutely battered. And as I said, if you held ETFs, you've actually done okay. If you had individual shares, you would be lucky to avoid them. I've only got one on that list. Um, and I'm surprised. So that is not a comprehensive list. That's why, because I've also got famous brands who would certainly fit into that as well. And the truth that I only have out of 12 shares, only two of them got decimated somehow is actually like a good thing. Like, I mean, there's portfolios out there where out of 12 shares, 11 got decimated. Bitcoin, so a year ago, I said it would end in tears. I was totally right about that. It is going to get more into theory. Quick disclaimer, I own two Bitcoins and I'm short eight Bitcoins because, hey, there's money to be made. Um, but the $20,000 which Bitcoin hit post the presentation last year was crazy. The current price of around $3,600 is approximately $3,600 too much. Bitcoin's a lovely idea, but the only practical purpose for Bitcoin is if you don't believe in central banks, if you think fiat currency is a fraud, and you are welcome to believe that. And back in the day, you would have championed for the return to the gold standard, and then people, like no one took that seriously, so now it's Bitcoin. The truth is that if you remove central central banks, probably you'll find the internet will fail because probably you will find the global economy will fail and forget ESCOM, there just won't be any power. Um, so Bitcoin solves a problem to which truthfully, you might not like central banks, but Bitcoin is not the better option, is the short answer. And then everyone says, ah, but blockchain, blockchain's the real McCoy. Turns out blockchain is as much as a scam of Bitcoin as it is. So blockchain is 10 years old this year. And uh, where is the real use, the real world example of blockchain being used? So I know Vinny, somebody in Cape Town is selling beer using blockchain. That's with all respect to Vinny and his beer, a gimmick. It's not a real world example. And here's the problem why blockchain. So blockchain is just a decentralized database. And frankly, SQL has been doing that since the 80s. Although back then it was access, whatever. It, it, the idea behind the problem with blockchain is that, and I'll give you an example, and this is a real world example. So in America, they've had some problems with lettuce and E. coli. And the problem when E. coli gets in lettuce is basically you burn every lettuce in the continent because you don't know when, where, or how it arrived. And the idea is, why don't we put lettuce on the blockchain? And therefore, when we find a bad lettuce, you'll be able to find all its cousins, aunties, and uncles, and like just destroy those ones, and everything will be fine. And in theory, that's brilliant. So what do you do? Well, now you've got these different lettuce growers and you need to create a central organization to control this process of the blockchain. And having created that organization, you no longer need the blockchain. Because the blockchain says, well, all these people don't know each other and don't trust each other and don't talk to each other. So yes, use blockchain. But in order to create the blockchain, all these people need to know each other and trust each other and talk to each other. And then we don't need blockchain. And then there's one other big problem with it. So someone has to scan that lettuce. Someone has to literally stand there with the scanner and scan every lettuce. And they get paid a dollar per lettuce to scan. And I'm like, just $10, don't scan my lettuce. They're like, ha -ha, boom, your lettuce isn't scanned. The weakness in the system is us, the humans. So blockchain works in a 100% digital world, i.e. crypto. But as soon as humans come into it, so it's a lovely experiment. It's a huge amount of fun. I hold two blockchain when the value, sorry, two bitcoins. When those two bitcoins are enough to get me a ticket to space, I will sell them and go to space. The problem is the price of tickets to space is coming down, but blockchain is coming down with bitcoin faster. So I might never get to space. Um, so it's fun. Bitcoin is going to end in tears. Uh, ESCOM. Yeah, oh, but. So the problem, I mean, the problem is not that we don't have coal. You go to Mpumalanga or northern KZN, you scratch the ground, you find coal. The problem is we don't have the right quality of coal. We absolutely have the quality of the coal. The problem, I mean, the problem is just epic mismanagement. And I'm being polite. You know, call it as it is, it was, it was state capture, it was pilfering of our ESCOM. Um, 
We're back to load shedding. The worst part about load shedding is the schedule. Where I live, I'm supposed to be shed on Sunday. I'm, so I plan my whole day around four hours of shedding. Nothing happens. Okay, weird. And then we get shed on Tuesday, I think. I check the schedule. No, no, we don't get shed on Tuesdays. My area doesn't get shed on Tuesday, even for stage 19. There is no shedding in my part of the world on Tuesday, except I have no power. So it's not that this is a problem because of lack of a certainty. It's that the pretense of certainty, which is there is a list, the list doesn't work. So you just go buy candles. Fortunately, I have gas. Fortunately, it's summer, so I don't need to run my electric floors. Um, there are a couple of issues. Firstly, the theory is it's at least probably five to seven years until we get it sorted. ESCOM needs somewhere between one and 200 billion. Czar, uh, like in a fair hurry, probably by the middle of next year, we don't have one or 200 billion Czar to give ESCOM. I don't know what the answer is, except that obviously we can't just shut ESCOM down. What it does do, so the, the good news is, is that a lot of industry has gone off grid. No, that's me, don't worry. The good news is you go to shopping centers and shops these days and what the sign outside says, we still operate during load shedding. Um, that's been a cost to them. And for a while they were like, oh, that generator is a waste of money. Now suddenly they're dusting it off. But there's obviously a lot of businesses that don't operate during load shedding. A lot of industry does. A lot of the mines have got off. A lot of the paper mills, a lot of the large producers, uh, not the aluminum smelter in, in, in Richards Bay, which frankly, if we shut that down, solves most of our problem. And the trick is not that we don't have enough capacity. We produce more capacity than we need because our demand is below what it was in 2007. The problem is a third of our power stations are currently off offline because they haven't been maintained. Um, these are simple things to solve, but they're not quick things to solve. And this is going to hurt us for a while to come. It is particularly going to hurt the smaller, very SA Inc. focused business. It's going to hurt the smaller mom and pop type stores. You know, Santon City's fine. They've got their gigawatts of, of, of power and everything and generating power, etc. Um, and where I live, when the power goes down, you just hear the generators tick up Whoop, and off they go. But it, it, it's going to, it, it, you know, we need five or six percent GDP. You don't get five or six percent GDP if you don't have power. It's just that simple. We can muddle along. We can get to two. We can do OK, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And an important point is don't mistake the stock market with the economy. Remember, 60% of the earnings of the top 40 come beyond our borders. Uh, Zimbabwe, who has no load shedding, you know, Botswana, Namibia, these kind of, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so don't get that confusion. But it's going to be, we're not going to get to three, four, five, six percent GDP growth if we don't have electricity. It's just that simple. That is not the rocket science. Quick last point on the fangs Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, and Google. Google, of course, is now Alphabet. They are all in bear market, they are 20% off their highs. For a brief window last Monday, Microsoft was actually the biggest company in the world as it overtook Apple. And for a brief moment, Apple and uh, Amazon were trillion dollar companies. They're now both sub $850 million companies. They've been sold off aggressively. The short answer is they are... They'd gone, they, they flew too close to the sun. Apple, the exception. Apple was never massively expensive. That PE topped out at around 19. That's perfectly fine. Um, the questions everyone's saying is, should we be buying? And there's some caveats. Facebook has massive regulatory issues. Quite simply, if you are fiddling in elections, that means you are fiddling with politicians' paychecks. That means you are in trouble. End of story. And it doesn't matter. Did the Russians give the election to Donald Trump? Did they give the elections to the Democrats in this last one? Did the Russians give us Brexit? The truth of the matter is, just don't mess with the politicians' livelihood. Facebook is going to find a heap of pain like you cannot imagine. They're going to get regulated like almost out of existence. I mean, as someone who neither likes nor uses Facebook, I have no particular problem with that. Um, but as an investment, they're going to find it a lot tougher going forward. Of course, they own Instagram and WhatsApp, and those are to a degree less vulnerable. WhatsApp's an interesting one, I remember. So WhatsApp messages are encrypted. So in America, the Yankees, have, they're like, they don't know what WhatsApp is. In South Africa, like if you don't have WhatsApp, it's like it's it's like there is no point. Um, but in Brazil, the, the Brazilian government wanted the messages that had been sent between two people, and WhatsApp said, "I can't give it to you; it's encrypted." And the Brazilian government said, "I don't know what you mean. Put that man in jail." 
So it's not that the politicians know what they're talking about. It's that the politicians want to be able to see your communication. Back in the olden day, they would steam open your letters. Or more recently, they would tap into your phone calls. Now they want to tap into your WhatsApp, and they can't because it's end-to-end -end encryption. And that creates a problem for them. So the regulation on WhatsApp is more likely to be, as Russia has done, just ban it. Just like, sorry, can't use WhatsApp, etc. So Facebook has a heap of pain. Alphabet has some regulatory issues more in the EU. In the e so in, 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 in uh, Chrome and Google is quite popular in the US, about 55% usage. In the EU, it's closer to 70 and 84% respectively. They're going to have regulatory issues. But a 5 million euro fine to Google is like, yeah, okay, write out a check, no problem. Apple, I like. Apple is changing. They're high, you know, they're going to stop telling us about the individual phone sales and the like, and they're just going to give you overall sales, etc. Because truthfully, we are buying less phones because they last longer, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I mean, Apple makes 30 billion on services, which uh, is a 500 billion it would make them about the largest company on the JSC. Just their services division. Forget everything else. Apple's sitting on about a quarter of a trillion in cash. Um, they're again not going to do the shoot it out the the, the growth, but in terms of I mean, do they have a captive market? Yeah. I mean, I use a Samsung phone, and it occurs to me, I have a MacBook, I have a MacBook Air, I have an iPad. Why have I got a Samsung phone? It just like, you know, just like drink the Kool-Aid and buy into it. And, and once you're in that ecosystem, it's tough to leave. It's until they try and charge you 26,000 Rand, and then it's actually like you just can't stay because it's got a little bit pricey. Um, Amazon is just a machine. So there's a lot of talk about regulating Amazon, but interesting distinction between regulation in America and in Europe. In Europe, the regulation is very centered around are you hurting other businesses? And if your actions hurt another business, that is anti competitive. In America, it's are you hurting the consumer? And you're hard pressed to say that. Amazon, who sends you stuff for free and gives you free movies, well, if you're a Prime member, and gives you excellent prices, is hurting the consumer. I mean, one day we're going to wake up and Amazon's going to own everything except Facebook, and it'll all be too late. But at this point, on that list, the one that attracts me is probably Amazon and, to a lesser degree, Netflix. Uh, Netflix's biggest problem is that they make a large amount of revenue. They've got about 150 million users giving them $10 a month. That is an epic amount of money. And they run off AWS, so their costs are fairly small, but they've got to produce content. And what's happening is people such as Disney are taking the content off and saying, you want to watch Disney, you pay us $10 here. And you want to watch. So now we get in that splintering of the whole process, and content production is expensive. And short answer is, can they produce it for the income that they get? The answer is, I'll tell you in about 10 years. So let's look at some 2019s. So we have elections, probably in May. Uh, May elections because 27 April and 1 May are big days in the liberation struggle movement, and therefore the ANC likes to use those as electioneering processes, and you can't have, you can't have rallies within three days of an election, so the election will probably be the first Wednesday, I think it's the 8th or something like that of May, will probably be our election this year. Elections are messy. This is not a South African phenomenon. Why are they messy? Because it is politicians fighting to keep their salaries. And let's be honest, you know, if you went to work tomorrow and your boss said to you, okay, like there's two of you, one salary sorted out, I mean, you would deck them, right? I mean, so it's just what the politicians are doing. They're not being... This is just how humans operate. Um, but it does mean that the rhetoric gets turned up about 492%. And I mean, the rhetoric from now, if you think what the politicians are saying is crazy today, yeah, yeah, wait for April. Then you'll see crazy, proper, proper crazy. So it's going to be deeply messy. It's going to be ugly. And the best advice is just to turn it all off and then go and vote on vote day. My prediction is simply the ANC will get plus 60%. The idea that the ANC will drop below 50%, so they currently have 62, and in the previous national election they got. And I'm looking at at, at Parliament. I'm not looking at at, at um, the, the, the 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 city council stuff. To move from 62 to under 50, a swing of that level basically happens one way, and that's if Robin Mugabe is running your election and stuffing your ballot boxes. Um, fortunately, so today or yesterday was Robin Mugabe's birthday. No one noticed. It's a thing of beauty. Um, 
my sense is quite simple. There are a lot of people who didn't vote ANC because of the current, well, the previous president, who I think will return to give Cyril Ramaphosa their mandate, because frankly, there are a lot of people who think that the idea of having the coalition parties and giving some of the smaller parties, and particularly, yes, looking at you folks in the red overalls, um, too much say is frankly a scary prospect. Um, and so I think the ANC is going to hold on. They had 66, then they dropped to 62. I think they'll stay sub 60. The interesting one to watch is, does the EFF implode or do they pick up on their 6%? And does the DA implode or do they pick up on their 24% which they got in the last national election? Um, we'll see in time. But I, the ANC is going to hang on for this point here. Uh, rating, we are two steps into junk, one step to go. That last step is Moody's. The risk, frankly, is ESCOM, and we are between a rock and a hard place. So we do nothing with ESCOM, the lights go off, and we are junk. Or we give ESCOM 200 billion, which we don't have, and we are junk. I don't know how you solve that. But you know what? That's why Tita Mboweni gets the money and not me. Hey? I think we will stay out, if only because Moody's is surprisingly... <laughs> Surprisingly, what's the word I'm looking for? Generous, accommodating, generous, kind, sweet. Who knew? But anyway, and our other rating agencies have us in junk, but stable, uh, stable junk, whatever that means. <laughs> but I do think that we will probably stay two foot in the in, 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 in the junk and one foot out of the junk. VAT, so we got our VAT increase 15%. I remember our last VAT increase in early 1990s. We went from 10 to 14%. Um, we got 1% increase last year, and that puts us at 15%, which is marginally below the global average, although that global average is skewed by Europe, where the VAT rates are excessively high. We are not going to get a VAT increase this year because, hey, election. Uh, but I don't know how Tito Mboweni is going to do that budget. I have no idea whatsoever. But um, as I say, he earns, he earns the bucks. He can figure it out. It is going to be – I mean – we probably, we might hit revenue projections, maybe, um, but costs are going. And where's our, you know, I, 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 I don't know how he does it. Not, in, not in, a, in, a, in a year where he's got an election coming either. Um, beyond perhaps just sort of like magic genies or something like that. Um, the point being is that he has a good team with him. We do have, and we now seem to have control of the important departments such as SARS, such as Treasury, back in the hands of people who are not just plundering the money to give to friends, family, and actually just friends and family. Um, and, and that puts us in a, in a remarkably better place. And just to pause there a moment. So this time last year, we had a President Zuma. We had a government which was captured beyond what we actually thought. We, we only now, thanks to the Zondo Commission, get a sense of how bad our, our, our state was captured. And as much as 2018 has not been a fun year, and as much as there is a lot to moan about, we have to accept that sitting here in December 2018 looks and feels a lot more comfortable than how we felt this time last year, when we weren't, weren't quite sure what was going to happen at NASRAC. Um, and uh, who knows what Nkosazana Glimini Zuma would have been like had she won? We don't know. But let's be honest, of the three potential, and I always say that uh, Jacob Zuma was a potential because he could have collapsed conference, um, the right person won. Uh, someone who at least we think has a chance to perhaps do it. Whereas we now know that our previous president didn't care. Uh, the kindest thing we can say is he just didn't care about us or the country. The czar... So I have for many years been saying the RAND will be stronger. Unfortunately, the one time I said it was exactly 48 hours before our then finance minister in Klanklanene got fired for the first time. There is a comedy somewhere with our finance ministers, but I think it's like too soon. I think we need to give it like another decade or two. So what do we see with the czar? This chart is going back just over 20 years. A couple of important points. If you take this data back to the 80s, the standard, the average depreciation between the rand and the US dollar is 4% a year. And it never feels like that because of these crazy flips out. But we lose about 4% a year against the US dollar. And guess what? 4% a year is about the difference between our inflation and their inflation. And that's how currencies work. That, that's how it is. What we see with our currencies is occasional massive blowouts and then recoveries that are somewhere between 50 and 70 percent. And massive blowouts and recoveries are between 50 and 70 percent. Massive blowout, we still need that recovery, which frankly takes us sub 10. Now, 
I'm not going to say sub 10 because if I say that, people think I'm stupid. Um, but I'm going to say sub 12, definitely, sub 11, probably. Not in a hurry. It's a slow grind. Look at those pros. I mean, we crash in a hurry and we grind very, very slowly, but we've had the crash and we, I'm fairly certain we'll get that slow grind back. So why? Because what happens? The RAND strengthens when money comes into our country. Why does money come into our country? Two reasons. Because people want to buy our bonds or people want to buy our equity. Why do you want to buy our bonds? Because our bonds pay 8.96%, call it 9%, and our government's not going to default. Why? Because they own the printing press. I know, inflation and all of that. But the point is, governments don't default anymore. That's so 1970s, so default is largely off the risk. So they want to buy our bonds, and then they want to buy our equity, which they haven't been for the last couple of years. But if we're expecting lower returns in the US, and we are, and I'll touch on why in a moment, then to get your return and your yield, you're going to start looking at cheaper markets, and that is emerging markets. And of that emerging market, as much as we think that we are a crazy loony country i mean i offer you turkey as an example or maybe i offer you saudi arabia where they kill journalists or perhaps i offer you russia um of the crazy and loony like we're not even allowed into the cage i mean like we're we're not even like like proper crazy i mean putin looks at us and says, amateurs you know stole it can you he stole everything including the economy so I'm predicting a stronger currency. At some point, we'll gather some speed. And in the next three to four years, we'll probably go sub-11. You might get down to the 10s. Uh, the top 40, this is a horrifying, horrifying chart. The 9% down this year is not the problem. The problem is that we are literally back to where we were in early 2014. If we were 9% down this year, but we'd been up 30 or 40 or 50% in the preceding four or five years, we would all shrug and say, yeah, nothing goes up forever. But it turns out it can go sideways forever. So we are literally, so that was just ahead of NASRIC. That was November. Then NASRIC happened, uh, and then Sura Maposa, and then it all just went horribly, horribly pear-shaped. Um, and just on the rand, I mean, we hit 11.55 this year. The day, the night that Ramaphosa announced his cabinet in February, our rand was 11.55. So my sub-12 sounds crazy, but we were there just in February. Um, what happens in this market is that over this four and a half years where we have gone literally nowhere, the earnings of the companies representing that index have increased. Not a lot, because we've had a tough market, but we could conceivably say that the earnings over the last five years has grown 30%, not annualized, in total, which if you compound it is about 5% a year, which is probably on the low side. But anyway, if our price is the same, but profits are up 30%. It means valuations are we are 30% cheaper. Now, of course, I told you that last year too. And now we are 9% down. Our market is cheap. Pick a metric. DCF, cheap. Uh, forward PEs, cheap. I mean, uh, uh, forward dividend yields, we are cheap. Our market is back at the levels of, in terms of valuations that it was at the bottom of the crisis of 08, 09. That... In a perfect world, that means at some point we start storming ahead and make money, but when is a whole different kettle of fish. There's another point that's critically important, which is reversion to the mean. If our long-term average on return is 12% and we have done 0% for four and a half years, we now need to exceed the 12% for the next four and a half years to get back to that average. Of course, going forward, the average could be lower. There was a time when our average on our market was 18%, but inflation was 10 Inflation is now six, so maybe our return is 10 or 12. So there's some caveats to it, but the simple math says we need to start moving higher at some point. At some point, foreigners are going to start looking at us as attractive. And don't think that foreigners care about politicians or ethics or ESCOM. They care about profits. And 60% of the profits of those companies come from beyond our borders. Of course, that was the one I was wrong on last year. Hey? So caveats, pinches of salt maybe. And I put this chart up every year just because it's a fascinating chart. And I talk about other EMs, and one of them is Brazil. And they got downgraded. I mean, the S&P hit them three times. Fitch, even Moody's made them junk. Their president got impeached. Their president went to jail. And the index went up 100% over a two-and-a-half-year period. And at some point, our index will start doing that. And I really hope it starts tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock but it might wait a bit, and I don't know how bit that will happen. And that just tells you that all the things that we worry about, downgrades and elected presidents in jail and stuff like that, markets don't. 
As an asset manager, you're looking some asset managers are top down, but mostly you look at a company and you say, Aspen, right, this is how much I pay for it. This is how much I'm going to receive in terms of dividends and profits. Is this attractive? Yes, I will buy it. And we know that. And what's my evidence? British American Tobacco, whose product kills people. And yet it is the biggest company on our exchange. No one's like, oh, no, that thing kills people. People are like, hey, can I make money? Yeah, hey, sorry, dead person. Of course, just if you thought that things were tough, we might have El Nino next year. So I can't find data for South Africa, but Japan and Australia both put a chance of El Nino next year at 70%. That's a really chunky chance. A uh, couple of important caveats. This will not impact the Western Cape because they're on a different weather system to what we are, um, which is about the only thing I remember from school geography. And... It's not going to be as severe as the previous drought, but it does mean that your food producers are in for another tough time. And that includes the Astrals, the Pioneers, the Tiger Brands, whose Poloni tried to kill us, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Tongart, and so, so the list goes on. Um, we, you know, it, it's going to be tough out there. And it's, I mean, 70% is a fairly, fairly chunky number. And it is going to hurt those food producers I don't like food producers as a rule anyway. Um, this is not going to help them in, in, in the least. Um, so as I say, top 40 is cheap. I think we will avoid uh, recession next year, but I'm not expecting GDP to shoot it out the park. Maybe we hit 1%. Um, part of that is earnings has been going up nicely. So those earnings are now cheaper. You're now buying, you're getting more bang for your buck uh, after that four and a half years of sideways moves. And just generic ETFs, the, the core top 50, the Satrix 40, the equal weight 40, any one of those generic ETFs is going to deliver decent returns. I must stress that when I say I'm bullish for the top 40 next year, Man, if we hit 10%, I'm popping the champagne. I promise. We, we and Christian are going to drink more champagne. In fact, I will promise you that if we hit 10%, I will buy a, a case of champagne and everyone is welcome to come and drink it after me and Christian have like drunk the first few bottles. Because it's like if you all come and I've only got a case, it's like not much bubbles for anyone. I'm expecting a green top 40 next year, but if it is only 10%, I, I, that truthfully is what I'm optimistic. 10%. And you know what? 10% will feel like Christmas. Man, it'll feel lovely. Remember those days? You youngsters have no clue, but the older folks, there's some, some older folks, you older guy, you remember when markets went up? Yeah, yeah, you're going to get that again. Yeah, it's going to be so much fun. Industrials, yeah, so industrials, so the index is too much NASPAS. There's some issues around industrials. A lot of the food producers sit in there. A lot of the uh, uh, suppliers into the food producers, Rolfs, Omnia, those sort of guys who provide the fertilizer and the like, they sit in that space. If we get on, you know, it's going to be deeply ugly. Um, but there are some stocks I like there. I'm still liking Richmond, Mr. Price and ShopRite. ShopRite, critical. So what's the deal with ShopRite? Apart from being the best food retailer that the planet has got, and I mean that sincerely, any food retailer with more than 1,000 stores, ShopRite has the best numbers across every metric, return on equity, operating margins, uh, 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 profit per employee, per, per I mean, boom, boom, and boom. Problem ShopRite had is 11,000 something, it's 11,000 and change of their products had deflation. The problem with deflation is quite simple. Your costs are going up, right? Your staff want increases. Your landlord wants increases. Man, ESCOM wants like loads of increases. I don't promise you power, but they... So all your costs are increasing, but your revenue's not because of deflation and product. So you get squeezed on the margins. That deflation and product is going to fall away next year. If, forget the drought. The drought will make it fall away a lot. But just because that deflation is a spinover from the... Re the previous drought disappearing, so prices in terms of maize and inputs coming down, and therefore deflation in food products. And I know you're looking at me and thinking, man, my basket of food is not deflating. I know. Understand what a basket of food in South Africa is. Maize meal and sunflower oil. And that's sincere. So ShopRite I really, really like. I also like City Lodge, because I missed an airplane a few weeks ago. So I ended up having to find any hotel that was open. It happened to be a city lodge. And if I'm anywhere, I'm a shareholder there. So I'm like, ha ha, site visit. That's what we call it. So I went and found the manager. And the manager, like a total rookie, happened to be sitting in the bar. So I'm like, this is going to be brilliant. Anyway, elections. What happens in elections? 
people move around the country. I mean, not me and you, but you know, the, 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 the political people move around the country. Now, the fancy politician people, they don't stay at City Lodge. They stay at the Hilton or the Western or something. You know, they stay somewhere la -di -da. But the foot soldiers, they stay at City Lodges. And this chap's comment to me was, I was talking to him and I asked about how his year was and he said it was poor. And I knew that because I could see his res the results, etc. And I said to him, what about next year? And his eyes light up. He says, we've got an election. And I'm like, hi. He says, this hotel in election time for about six weeks, man, I've got people who would pay me to sleep on the pavement. So they're going to get that fill up in that point. And I understand how a hotel works, right? You've got a flat cost. You sell an extra 10 beds. It doesn't cost you any extra money. It just means that all the staff work a little bit harder. Yeah, yeah, you've got a little bit of extra toilet paper and soap you've got to expense. But it's that leverage impact. So whilst we're waiting for the economy to pick up, mm -hmm. uh, we'll get an election which will give a fill up. And the key point with City Lodge is they are not – they're not holiday makers. They are, 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 so Airbnb is of no concern to them. The fact that we can't afford to go on holiday beyond like we're going to Benoni for our holidays this year um, doesn't impact City Lodge at all. City Lodge is business people and politicians. So City Lodge I'm liking a lot. Construction, manufacturing, man, you can't stay far enough away if you tried. Financials. So this slide is pretty much a repeat of last year because last year this was all true and it remains true a year earlier, later, notwithstanding the index went up all of 1.8% and actually considering it pays a 3% dividend, the index went down and the dividend saved your life. Um, our banks, excluding VBS, well actually they no longer count, do they? Our banks are incredibly well capitalized. Basel III starts kicking in next year, and we have been ahead of Basel III capital adequacy requirements for years and years. Don't worry what they are. It just means they have more money than they legally are required to. What's very important is that we note that their impairments, which we call in English bad debts, are sitting at between 0.4 and 0.9%, which is historically low. We also know from the Reserve Bank data that South Africans' indebtedness in other words, the amount of debt that we have, household debt that we have, is at decade lows. We have less debt than we had in 2007. And the reason is simple. It's not because we don't want debt. It's because we have something called a credit act. Credit, uh, what was it, the NCR, National Credit Act, National Credit Regulator, the Consumer Protection Act, all of those things came in, and suddenly it became harder to lend money. And banks were a little bit scared after 08, 09, but simply they've, they, you know, again, you old folks will remember 110% uh, home loans at prime minus two. <laughs> you mention that to your bank manager and he's going to punch you. Like, I don't talk, don't swear at me like that. It's so credit. To, so, so the South African consumer is under pressure, but they're not under cost of debt. Average South African consumer has one third the amount of debt of the average American consumer. And the average American consumer has less debt than they had in 2007. Um, so the banks are very well positioned. Basically, pick your bank. My favorite is Capitec, but it is expensive. There was a brief window at 700 bucks where it was only slightly expensive. But 1,100 Rand Capitec is very expensive and has been since about 2005. Um, but Coronation. So here's my other real big pick for the year. Coronation, asset manager, we know it, we hate them, they give us terrible returns, they charge us fees. However, they currently at below 50 Rand have a dividend yield of 9%. After tax, call it 7% dividend yield. So you're paid better than cash rate to hold the share, and you have the option of coronation. Coronation's last set of results saw earnings down, saw HEPs down, and saw revenue down, and saw dividends down, all by little bits and assets under management. They're Market cap to asset under management ratio is 1.6%. The long-term average is 25 It should at least revert to the long-term average. In truth, it will probably overshift. If they can start producing some returns, which frankly need a bit of a market to be doing something for us, and Coronation can start generating some money, we've got an uplift in the price, not only because it's got the discount to, to its normal market cap to, to, to Orm, um, but an increase in profitability. If they add just 10% more uh, 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 assets under management, which is 60 billion are, they add that 10%, they earn 60 points on it, and suddenly, it, for them, forget performance. It just it falls to their bottom line. It just goes straight down to their bottom line. So you're buying this at the cheapest price you could have bought it at any stage in the last 15 years, and you get paid 9% or 7% after tax to hold it. 
Resource stocks. So it's quite simple. If the trade wars don't go away, forget resource stocks. Because if there's trade wars, China suffers, and if China suffers, commodities are dead. So we need we need very strong resolution on, on the commodities. Um, the oversupply has largely gone. The commodity companies have less debt and more cash than they have in the history of commodity companies, which means at some point they're going to start buying things. Remember, if you own a company and they go and make a big deal, sell it. So if you own a commodity stock and they go and buy some big asset somewhere or try and buy a competitor, your best course of action is take the money and run. Just as simple as that. Um, oils, probably in the 60 to 70. On the one side, you've got uh, your floor is the frackers. If the price goes too far down, the frackers exit. And as the price goes up, the frackers just move in. The point with fracking, whereas a normal oil well in Saudi Arabia or Iran or Russia, a normal oil well, to turn it on and off is a process that takes months sometimes six or nine months. A fracking operation, they can phone you on Friday and on Monday they're getting oil out of the ground. So the frackers turn quick. Under 60, they're losing money, they pull supply. Over 80, they're making so much money, they pump as much oil as they can. Oil is no longer an OPEC story, oil is now a fracking story. The comfortable price for Brent is around 60 to 70. Your best deals in the space, I think, Billiton. They're energy focused, uh, lesser degree. They've got their iron ore. As I said, if trade wars don't go away, leave it alone. Platinum is still going nowhere very slowly. Palladium, if you want to get a PGM. The distinction is palladium goes into petrol. Platinum goes into diesel. The problem is post the VW scandal in America around them cheating on their emissions, diesel has become a swear word in Europe. So the Europeans are just like, yeah. So petrol is uh, China and, and America and therefore palladium. And for those who noticed that I didn't comment on gold, it's because gold. Retailers, we have some of the best retail operations in the world on our JSC which is fortunate because if we didn't, then they would all be dead by now. Um, so the food retailers have been hurt by, by price deflation. The clothing retailers have been hurt by all sorts of things. I mean, Woolies just keeps on getting their fashion wrong. Um, like, like, and this is not my saying because, you know, but like people who actually shop at Woolies. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I wanted a suit and I went to Woolies and they just, I mean, uh, long story, not worth it. Um, you own Woolies because of Chuckles, right? That's why you own Woolies, Chuckles. But my favorites are ShopRite, Pick and Pay, finally under pressure, Pick and Pay is getting things right. Their, their operating margin is still a measly 2%. The credit card companies make 2.1, Pick and Pay makes 2. The credit card companies do nothing and they make more money. Um, but my sense is that Brash has finally got it right. The evidence will be next set of results. We need to see that operating margin start to expand. And then if he can get that operating margin from two to two and a half to three, I mean, your profits, uh, it just it just goes cra absolutely crazy. He's still got to do it, but he finally, after four or five years, is starting to do it. And Mr. Price, they had a stumble a, crap a couple of years ago, um, but they, they've bounced back strongly. They, I mean, the thing with Mr. Price is they, they are cheap and nasty, but that's exactly, I mean, you buy a Mr. Price article of clothing, you don't expect it to last two Christmases. But like it didn't cost much, so you're happy if it lasts at least one. And it probably will last one if you like careful with it. Um, so Mr. Price works and they're cash, so they don't, you know, et cetera, it's not the credit space. So retailers, Mr. Price, shop right, pick and pay. Interest rates. So our MPC promised us three more increases before the end of 2020, which would take up our, our, our prime rate to 11%. But what they were doing, I mean, the vote was 3-3, and our good governor had the casting vote, because the previous time it was 4-3, but the one guy quit, and he was a voter for no increase. And it's like, dude, who let you quit? Anyway, 3-3, and our governor has the casting vote. And his logic was painful but sound. His logic is the risks abound, right? Oil. I mean, at, at that MPC meeting, oil was still you know, north of 75. Where's oil going? Where's RAND going? The risk to inflation is potentially it shoots out the top of the band. And as a, as a reserve bank, you need to be ahead of the curve because if you get behind the curve, there is no catching up until the curve turns. So how do you get ahead of the curve? You raise rates when it looks like you don't need to. That's how you operate. However, if 
oil stays at reasonable levels and the rand moves a bit stronger and inflation looks fairly benign, et cetera, et cetera, we might not see three increases over the next two years, maybe only one, maybe two, maybe none. But I do think probably he's going to stay his hand at least until third quarter of next year. So cautiously optimistic that maybe less and then perhaps even zero in time. Europe has to start doing something. When a crisis happens, what do you do? You cut interest rates. What do you do when your interest rates are at zero? The answer is we don't know. Well, actually, we do. Japan, man, that didn't work. You need the interest rates to defend it. The US is still at record low rates. I mean, they're off the absolute lows, but if you look at their long-term average, they are way below the long-term averages. Jerome Powell at the Federal Reserve is walking back some of his increases, um, so we might see less aggressive. Instead of three in the US next year, we might only get one or two. But Europe needs to at least stop the quantitative easing and start to get ready to raise interest rates, because the next financial crisis is coming. And I'm not saying it's coming this year, I'm saying it's coming at some time in the future, and Europe needs to be ready. And right now, if, it, if the financial crisis comes next year, Europe is not ready. And I don't know what happens when that happens. I mean, all we have is Japan, who's tried everything, and 40 years later still haven't found a solution. So I think that uh, Super Mario, to his friends, Mario Draghi, to his colleagues, um, is going to start at least pulling back on his quantitative easing and talking about raising interest rates. Um, and the U.S. edging higher, but it seems like they will be slowing down. China is storming along. Yes, the numbers are coming down. But you know what? If you're the second biggest economy in the world and you're only growing at 6%, which part of only growing at 6% is bad? It's 6%. You're the second biggest economy in the world and you're growing at 6%. That's absolutely massive. The transition continues from industrialization to consumerization. The ETN is DBCHIN. I prefer Richmond and Discovery. Uh, Discovery, very small with Pu An um, and Richmond with their overpriced fancy watches. China's doing fine. The big problem with China is, is, is that uh, orange man in the US. So the U.S. has had its longest bull market in the history of the U.S. Uh, March will be 10 years. It is, it is un I mean, so March 2009, it bottomed, and we haven't had a 20% pullback in that entire period, which is absolutely an astounding, astounding fact. I mean, it, it, it's just gobsmacking. Um, typically, you get a 20% pullback every three or four years, and here we are, we're almost into 10. However, that market is 10% off the highs. This chart's slightly out of date. That's Monday. Tuesday was 2,700. It dropped another 60 points. I think in the short term, over now January, uh, December, January, February, while Trump and Xi have their bun fight, uh, et cetera, et cetera, I think we're going to see more weakness into markets. I think the U.S. is going to lose another 10%, take it down into the 2,300s. That's a 20% pullback. That's a full bear market. And the valuations are then more attractive. Those fangs are at better prices. And then the U.S. can start running again. But it's not going to run at the same level that it has over the last decade because they've got well ahead of the average. Reversion to the mean means the next decade's returns will be lower. Of course, what we have all done is what we classically do is we run to where the ball is. The U.S. is doing brilliant. The RAND is weak, licks by the S&P 500. And you should always run to where the ball is going. In other words, well, if they're doing great, what's going to do great next? Not an easy question, but I think the returns out of the U.S. the next three to five years are going to be, they'll be all right, but they're not going to be the 26% that we saw in 2017. And already this year, at the close of yesterday, no, they were closed yesterday, the close of Tuesday, literally it was up about a point over the last 52 weeks. So I expect a green, I expect a red start to the year, I expect a green 2019 for the S&P, but I expect it to be single digit, and I expect it to be single digit for the next couple of years. We've got all the various different ETFs. The other killer is if that market's only growing at, say, 7 or 8% a year, and the RAND is, say, strengthening at 7 or 8% a year, your investment is going sideways. Of course, the point being is I'm talking about two, three, four years. That is short term. But remember, investing is measured in decades. Um, if the trade wars don't get resolved, all bets are off. European Union, yeah, I mean, it's muddling along, it's doing, a, doing okay, Angela Merkel leaves, which is going to feel weird. You know, this whole thing, we have term limits around the world, hey? You know that since 1990, Germany's had three presidents, or chancellors. 
Like they don't do term limits there. No, no, no. Term limits is for other people. In the UK, term limits is for other people. France, no, no, they don't do term limits. Term limits is for Africa. No, they call me a liar. And America, and thank God for term limits in America. It means you've only, at, at max, we've got six more years of the orange man. If we didn't have term limits in America, who knows? Um, I like the US, I like Europe better than the US, assuming Mario Draghi starts to pull back on his QE. And the reason is quite simple, is because they were late to the party, so they were late to the benefit and they don't yet have the hangover. I think we can see some better returns coming out of Europe than we're seeing in the US. Uh, Signia EU tracks, I prefer the worldwide. Yeah, so the problem with jumping into Europe is lacquer, but then you've got a time when to get out. And as you mentioned, two decisions, where to go, when to exit, where to go next. I uh, just buy the world, you know, buy a global thing, the Ashburton 1200, the Signia worldwide, something like that. Um, and as Europe does better, its weighting in the index will increase. And as America, you know, f does less good, its weighting in the index will decrease and it autocorrects itself nice and simple. Brexit, ach man, they vote on Tuesday. It's an unholy mess. So 2019, I'm expecting some bearishness. I'm then expecting a positive year, but I'm not expecting a knockout year. If we do 10% lacquer, US 6 or 7, sure. It's going to be a bit of a grind of a year. Locally not helped by candles and elections are going to make it feel a lot more painful than it actually truly is. Um, some stocks, and I've touched on them already. Uh, mid caps. So I haven't touched on mid caps for a very simple reason. First, your big caps move. So first, our top 40 has to go up 50, 60, 80, 100 percent. And then the market starts to say, oh, this top 40 is expensive. And then it starts looking at mid caps and small caps. There are small caps out there. West Coal is, is trading on a two times cash flow. You buy that company and you know, they, they coal miners, right? No disrespect to West Coal, but coal mining is like not hard. Like you scratch the surface and you find coal. Two times cash flow. You buy that business, its cash flow pays for it in two years. That is insane. Is the price going up? Don't be silly. No one's buying coal mines, not small coal mines either. So, I mean, there, there, are, there are tons of them. The small cap is littered with insane valuations. What we're truthfully going to see is delistings, and that just serves to prove the point. So ignore the small caps for at least a couple more years. Retailers... ShopRite, Mr. Pay, Pick and Pay, Coronation. If you want to go easy on the banks, because which bank to buy, and the answer is not sure, the Satrix Finney is a nice and simple answer. ETF. Property, I haven't mentioned. Property is at the cheapest it's been in 15 years. Go check the Keelan and Glouville presentation of October, which he did for us in this very room here. You're getting a nice yield. The trick is that properties, the, 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 you're getting about a 8 or 9% yield in the ETF, which is very nice, but don't expect the stocks to start moving anytime soon because they're struggling. The struggling economy, ESCOM, et cetera, et cetera, um, but they are cheap. They're in many cases below NAV. The yield is above the, the long bond rate, and both of those tell you that property is attractive at current levels. NASPAS, for the simple reason that it's cheap, two things, multi-choice. Everyone on Twitter will tell you that they don't have DSTV anymore. Turns out, they're liars. <laughs> How do I know that they're liars? Because NASPAS does this funny thing. They publish results. And what do we see? DST subscription in South Africa is up 12%. Ooh, Twitter lies. Who knew? Who knew? Um, here's the thing. The average revenue per user is down. So, yes, less people are paying for the premium package. But everyone's like, oh, multi-choice is dead. No, no, multi-choice is not dead. Look at Comcast in the U.S. Look at Disney. No, no, multi-choice is not dead. They will spin out next year. Uh, and Tencent suddenly discovered that they've got other businesses, such as micro-lending, such as uh, uh, um, uh, 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 all the other bits and pieces, mine gone blank, and the games will come back. So I think you'll get your multi-choice for free, and I don't think it's a terrible stock. I think you'll get the games coming back, and maybe we'll get a bit of a close on that discount as well. So I think NASPAS, oddly enough, is looking attractive. I don't buy NASPAS because I own NASPAS via the ETFs that I hold. And then Billiton and Sassel. Billiton, because of its diversified nature, Sassel, and not everyone agrees on the Sassel one. So they have finally finished their ethane cracker plant in Louisiana Lake Charles, the U.S. They spent about twice what they promised. No surprises there, but at least the capex is now spent. 
that's gone out the window. They start generating the profit. And I think they're a little gun shy. And I don't think Sasol is going to do another $12 billion deal in a, in a hurry. And they're going to start giving that money back to us as shareholders. And very importantly, the key thing with Sasol is they're no longer going to be an oil company. They're going to be an oil and chemical. And those two are currently cyclical. So they'll be less of a cyclical company. And then City Lodge, I've touched on that. ETFs, as always. Your tax-free portfolio, max that out first, keep it simple, keep it broad, keep it offshore, keep it local, just carry on buying ETFs. If you're buying ETFs this year, you probably beat most of the active people. Buzzword for 2019 is going to be inversion. The yield curve has inverted. In other words, the short term is now above the long term. All that means is people are concerned about the immediate time, the, 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 what's happening in the immediate, and we understand that with the whole trade wars. What they will also tell you is that every time this happens, there has been a recession, but they miss an important point. If we have high inflation and an inversion, we get recession. We don't have high inflation. So inversion is just something which the people on TV are going to be talking about. And now you can nod wisely and say, lucky there isn't inflation. And this lady is why we are positive for the future and we have not emigrated to Zimbabwe. So Ramaphosa could have chosen anyone. Well, not quite. He could have chosen many people to head up the National Prosecuting Authority. He could have done a process that was completely secretive. He did not. He opened the process to the public. He asked the questions. This lady crapped all over them for saying, why are there no women on the selection committee? And they were like, ooh, hell, noted. Tell you what, we make you boss. However, <laughs> she's untainted because she spent the last nine years in The Hague working for the International Criminal Court. Before that, she worked in the National Prosecuting Authority in KwaZulu-Natal, where she prosecuted uh, taxi warlords with no fear nor favor. He could have taken a slightly easier route. He could have taken someone who maybe wouldn't quite come running after his ANC card raise too hard. Not Sean Abrams style, but kind of like a middle line. He didn't. He picked the best person for the job. And that's why we haven't immigrated to Zimbabwe. Because we have hope. Because she only starts in February, so don't expect anyone in jail just yet. She's got to serve out her notice at the ICC. But that lady tells us that Sora Mopoza is not former President Zuma. He is trying as best he can to do the right things. And I know we have uh, Batabiri Glamini still in the cabinet, but she has to be in the cabinet because she's head of the ANC Women's League. And you don't go into an election without the ANC Women's League on your side. That is politics. It's dirty. It's horrible. We don't like it, but it's how it works. And that lady tells us that President Ramaphosa is trying and he's being honest with us. And from a politician, that's way more than you expect. And then Bloodhound. Man, every year I stand up here and I say they're going to come to the Northern Cape and they're going to go deeply fast. And 2016, they didn't come. They didn't come. They didn't come. You know what? They're not even saying they're coming next year, but I live in hope because I'm not a petrol head, but I want to go and see that thing do a thousand miles an hour through the Western Cape. And apparently, I'm going to be very old and very gray before that happens. <sighs> I, th yeah, I put that as my banker for 2016 because it's like, yeah, it's going to be easy. Uh, like, no, 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 and no. It's a horror. Um, and that's it, ladies and gents. I think next year is going to grind us. At least I think we're expecting it, which will make it less bad. This year we were optimistic and it took us from left field and hurt us. I do think we're going to see some positivity in the markets, but I do not think it's going to be a stonking bull market. But for you youngsters, Things do go up sometimes, I promise you. I really, really, really promise you. I, I'm old enough to remember those days, like only just, but I do remember the days. The world is not ending, and that's because I assume that she and Trump will find some sort of peace in our time. I'm going to park it there. I have run my time. I apologize. I will end with a few quick points. Uh, my thanks to the JSC. My thanks to Christia for 2019. Most importantly, my thanks to you, ladies and gents, for coming, for supporting, for asking the questions, for poking, for pointing out where I'm a fool and uh, pointing out sometimes when I'm not, but for giving the feedback, engaging, etc., whether it be here or on Twitter or email or whatever the case may be. Uh, this is my final event. My holiday starts, my year end starts in approximately 12 seconds if I talk fast. I hope you all have grand holidays. If you work in the service industry, thank you very, very much. Someone has to serve us over this period. Uh, be safe. We'll see you next year. Thank you very, very much for your time.